You are listening to The Future of Work, Water Cooler Conversations, where business leaders share how they integrate humanity and technology to create a better workplace for today and tomorrow. This radio show and podcast is brought to you by Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center. And now let's listen in as Jen Burrell and Kyle McIntosh connect with today's valued guests. And we're back with the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations. I'm Kyle McIntosh here with my co-host and good friend, Jen Burwell, and our fascination with business leaders who have developed innovative approaches, healthy cultures, flexible workspaces, and seamless virtual technology. Today, we are excited to introduce you to Austin Peterson, founder of Backbone Financial, the financial plan and financial planner. Hello, Jen, first of all. Hello, good to see you. Yeah. And Austin, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. So I just said uh, Austin Peterson, founder of Backbone Financial and Financial Planner, but this first question is just for Austin, the guy. Uh, (laughs) You got it. So we like to start off the show with where did you come from? And, you know, what was life like uh, growing up? How did you get from where you started to where you sit today? Yeah, so it's kind of a a long story. I grew up uh, in Provo, Utah, most of my uh, youth, right? I spent a small amount of time in Denver, Colorado, where my dad took a a different job out there at the Stapleton Airport, but uh, most of it was in Provo, Utah. Um, My grandfather was a farmer, and my parents were divorced when I was young, and so I actually spent quite a bit of time on the farm with my grandpa. So I tell people that uh, that I grew up on a farm, which is partially true, but I learned, you know, some great lessons. I mean, I would I would say my my grandfather, who's passed away now, is is one of the heroes of my life, and and taught me some really important life lessons while driving on a tractor with him, and just talking and learning about the importance of work and and what the opportunities are uh, in this life if we grab onto them and and do what we can. Very cool. What about the name Backbone Financial? What, uh, what's the significance of that? When I got ready to form my own practice, um, well, I should say even form my own practice. I mean, I was, I was practicing already, um, but just operating under the name Lincoln Financial Advisors, which is my, my broker dealer and my registered investment advisor. But I, I got tired of people asking me if I was an employee of Lincoln Financial Advisors when in fact I'm not. I'm an independent contractor. Uh, and I thought, you know what, it's time to kind of market under my own name. And I spent several weeks just looking at different options, trying to figure out what what really kind of explained what it is that I do. And the name Backbone came to me one afternoon and I thought, you know, everybody uses the term the backbone of, a, of the American economy as the small business owner. And since I serve primarily small business owners in my financial planning practice, it was it was the perfect name. And then on top of that, I like the fact that it's got a, a dual connotation of, of, you know, people talk about somebody having backbone, which means, you know, integrity. And so it, uh, that's how the name, the name was born. I love it. So Austin, tell me a little bit more, like what got you interested in the financial service industry? Like what's your why behind backbone? Yeah. So it, it it's a, an interesting story. I grew up pretty pretty poor. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the farm, like I said, with my grandpa, but my, my dad uh, was a business owner later in life for me uh, in terms of, you know, like high school, junior high years, but never really made a great living. There were times when my family was on welfare or food stamps or those sorts of things. And, and so, you know, I, I knew that I didn't want that to be the case for me financially. Um, but really what kind of led me down this path and, and having an interest in, in this was a class that I took my freshman year of high school. Uh, I was sure I was going to be an attorney. I wanted to be a, a criminal defense attorney, and, and I thought that was exactly what I would be doing. It was very appealing to me to stand in a courtroom every day defending somebody. But I took this, this class. It was an elective. It fit my schedule, and it was called Stock Market and Entrepreneurship. And it changed my complete viewpoint on, on what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wasn't sure how it would work out, what that meant. I didn't understand that there was a, an opportunity to be a financial planner. 
but I was very intrigued by the whole idea of building my own business. And then just the fact that we did research for stocks back then. And, you know, Jen might be too young for this. Kyle, I know he's younger than me too, but we used to research stocks by using an actual newspaper. You know, this was (laughs) pre-internet. So I have a funny story about that, Austin. A long time ago, and I'm older than Kyle, by the way. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I appreciate that. A long, long time ago when I was little, they used to have Motorola. My parents worked for Motorola and they would have bring your kid to work day. And I went to work and my stepfather, he had me look at the microfish machines. I don't even know if that is that how you say it, microfish. Microfish, yeah. And look at the stocks and do all this research for him on all the different stocks in the newspaper. So I have a vivid memory of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I honestly, I, I look back at that as the way that my life completely changed. And uh, I'm so glad now that I didn't go to law school and, and didn't pursue that as a career opportunity because unfortunately I have too many friends who did and, and they're just really not happy. They make a good living, but they really don't enjoy what they do. It's interesting that, uh, I mean, there must be stuff from growing up on a farm that you still keep with you today. Uh, and, and eventually, you know, you got to the ripe old age of high school and figured out what you wanted to do with the rest of your life. But, uh, like what, you know, what sticks with you that from being a kid that you can, that you can think about that you could share? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing honestly is, is the importance of hard work and that you can really accomplish anything that you put your mind to, um, and, and not being afraid of work or, you know, I, I'm, I'm the most educated in terms of formal education uh, of anybody in my family, right? But I learned at a young age that you shouldn't look at or treat anybody any differently if they're in the blue collar type of a, of a job or they do things differently than you. You're not any better. You're not, you know, but you may be different, but you're not any better than, than they are. And so I guess just treating people with respect regardless of, of what they do for a living, regardless of what their circumstances are and work hard. And if you, if you put all the effort that you can into what you're trying to do, that you'll, you'll find success. This is a little bit of a tangent, but you just made me think, um, my best friend, um, for many, many years, she grew up in Minnesota and her family has a, a dairy farm. And then they also do soybean and corn. And so even, um, in, she had a professional job. We both worked as interior designers. She would go home in the summer and work harvest because that's just what you do. And her work ethic, like, I thought I had a great one, but she just could outwork anyone. And so I often think about that when I'm raising my own children. You know, you have children, Austin. How do you, like, instill that farm experience in a non-farm environment? Yeah, honestly, I wish I knew the answer to that. I've, I, I look back now and I think, you know, my kids are 21 and 17, almost 18 now. And I've had multiple conversations with my wife where I feel like we, we just blew it. You know, I mean, my, my kids are great kids. They work hard in school. They've always gotten good grades. They do, you know, my son works at Amazon now and he, he's, you know, going to school full time and working about 25 hours a week at Amazon. So he, he does understand hard work, but I, one of the things that I think where we really just kind of missed the, the boat was my kids don't understand at all what it's like to struggle financially. They've never experienced it in their lifetimes. And I I didn't want them to, right? I mean, that was my whole focus was to make sure that they didn't feel the way that I did when a friend of yours from high school is the checker at the grocery store and your mom's paying with food stamps. I didn't want them to ever experience that, right? Um, But at the same time, there's a certain entitlement that has come in this generation overall and with my kids that I wish didn't come with them, unfortunately. Yeah, I think about that a lot because um, I had a similar experience growing up as you asked in my family. My dad was a serial entrepreneur and there were years where things were awesome. And then there were years where things were very, very bad. And um, I remember like um, not having enough money for the grocery store or, um, having to put groceries back because we didn't have, we only had a certain amount of money. And, and so I've been very determined with my own parents, like I'm going to make sure that I 
um, can my, I mean, my parents provided for me, but those were disabled. Like, I don't want them to worry about money, but I can already see the reverse of it happening. Um, and my oldest is six. And so I, I just constantly think about like the farm thing of like, how do you even so work ethic without actually having a farm? And how do you also uh, like have that, have, have them have struggle? Because I think I wouldn't be who I am today without that struggle. So I, I, I don't know that I regret the experience, but I don't know that I want, you know, the trauma that also came with that um, in my case. So. It's yeah. an it's an interesting thought experiment too of like if you can't have somebody actually go through the experience of experiencing it themselves, how do you give them perspective on this? And so a little I, I hear things every once in a while, little experiments that if you want, you know, if your kid uh if you want them to think entrepreneurially, have them come up with new ways of solving things around the house or uh, you know, travel and, and see what different cultures are like. And it, but there, but there is really at some point, no, there, there's no, uh, comparison to really going through it yourself and really feeling those feelings and being in it. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I wish, I wish we'd done a better job of it. I mean, we did some, you know, chore chart type things and earn your own money for certain things and you pay for this and we'll pay for that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably making it sound worse than it is. Cause I mean, again, I have very, very good kids. They're well adjusted. They will be fine. Um, but I, I feel like because things were so rough growing up and the, the toll that that took on me mentally, I overcorrected so that my kids never felt that way. And I, I think I may have done them a disservice at some point. And I've talked to my parents, specifically my mom about this a, a few times and you know, I think she just gives me a pass. You're a great father. You're doing great. You know, you're doing great things. Your kids are great. But um, there is a part of me that wishes they would have had to learn some lessons or, or I figured out a way, like you said, to mimic those types of situations for them. And I also think, you know, it's their path to walk as well. So maybe they didn't, the lessons that they need to learn, like life has a way of teaching you those lessons. So, uh, I, that, at least that's my own past in my head that I tell myself as well. So let's shift a little bit to talking about backbone. And can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And you mentioned small business owners as, as your clients, but just give us a little bit of, of background. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about uh, business owners in America, we already talked about them being the backbone of the economy. And it, it's it really is a, a big business, if you will, the the small business community but what happens is they're so focused on building their business that they don't take the time to step back and really plan for the largest asset that they own, right? And they they don't realize that it's an asset. They're not treating it like it's an investment. Um, they're just treating it as, you know, this is my job and I'm building this company and, and I'm going to work, work, work until I find success. And then they start to make some money and they'll go out and buy toys and they do these sorts of things, but they're never really planning for what the future holds, right? And so most, not all, but most business owners that I engage with for the first time, their business is not only their biggest asset, but outside of their personal residence, a lot of times is their only asset. They don't have any other investments. They've not done any planning outside of their business. And so it's really about assessing what it is that they have. What does the plan look like for you going forward? How long do you want to be running this business? Do you have a business that can actually be sold down the road? And if you do, how do we get it to the, to the best possible scenario so that you're selling it for top dollar, you're transitioning it to who you want it to be transitioned to, and then we're preparing ahead of time so that when that transition actually happens, we're doing it in a way that's tax efficient, right? We're not avoiding taxes. You just, you can't do that, but there are certain things that we can do to minimize the taxes when that actually happens. And so that's the largest part of my focus. There's of course things, you know, in between helping the, the business owner set up a 401k plan or, you know, all those sorts of things for their, for their employees and for themselves to save. But it's about prepping that business for sale. And then along the way, you know, we, one of the terms that my business partner and I use all the time is that we're working with business owners to get some things 
off of their business balance sheet and onto their personal balance sheet so that they do they do have a more well-balanced portfolio of investments and really understand that their business is an investment and let's treat it as such. That's got to be an interesting conversation with somebody in the beginning who hasn't really conceptually thought of it in that way. I've got this baby that I'm creating that I'm putting all my love and heart and tears and energy and everything into. And and you're what you're telling me in a way is, all right, I've got to look at this thing in real ones and zeros. And, and what is the end impact? And even if you just take out the financial part of it, that contemplating the end impact of this thing I'm creating right now. Uh, that's There's got to be a lot of guidance, I'm, I'm guessing, on your end of uh, how to even introduce that concept to somebody. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I share with business owners frequently is if you had bought whatever, pick a number, $100,000 worth of Tesla stock a decade ago, you'd be very, very happy today, Right. But the reality is nobody takes and, and, and assume that whole that $100,000 is all the money that you had. Nobody takes all of their money and puts it in Tesla, right? Could have worked out well, but the risk is through the roof because you just bet on one company. Well, business owners are doing the exact same thing in their own businesses. They're betting 100% on one investment. And if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong and and their business and their family pay the price. I think that's the other thing that uh, a lot of business owners don't even contemplate is how could this ever go wrong? I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I will outwork this ever being having the possibility of going wrong. And you know what? You can you can work as hard as you can, you can put in as many hours as you can, but at some point there's only twenty four hours in the day. And unless you can replicate yourself, uh, it's just unsustainable. So I mean yeah, definitely good things to think about at all, at all times during creating a business. Yeah, yeah. And I, I honestly, I think that business owners underestimate the risk that they're taking on in, in their own business and that, that exists in their business day to day. And until they start to look at it through a buyer's eyes, they don't realize what those, what those risks even are because it's their everyday life. It's what they do all day, every day. They understand it. They've digested it. But when it's time to have somebody else look at it from the outside as an opportunity to buy that business, then they do start to see all the different risks. And and quite honestly, one of the biggest risks is that the business is heavily dependent on the founder or the owner or the CEO or whoever it is. And the value of a business actually goes way up by there not being a dependency on the owner. The less you're needed operationally, Right. We talk about we use the term operational irrelevance. The the more you're operationally irrelevant to a company, the the higher the value of that company. That's a heady place to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's something we all we all strive to get to. Yeah, I have a good friend who is in that position and um he's so bored. Like he's like, when I go to the office, I make more trouble than if I just stay away. And so he does what you were saying, like he buys toys and he goes and does things. Um, So what do you see, like what should business owners be doing differently or or what like big mistakes do you see often when people come talk to you? Yeah, I mean, the first one I already kind of mentioned, and that's just the fact that they need to treat their business like an investment, right? And understand that that's a part of their overall net worth, the part of their overall investment portfolio, and what can we do to diversify? And so it's, you know, it's taking some investment off the table, whether it's distributions from the business and reinvesting them either in a different business or in the stock market or in real estate or, you know, something that takes some chips off the table is a big thing um, for business owners. That's, That's likely the biggest mistake if I had to point to one. Um, but the the other aspect of that is just just planning in general. They're they're not taking enough time to slow down, take a step away from the business, and plan for what that business is going to represent to them and to their family potentially for generations. So this had me thinking. Um, uh, we work with a lot of small businesses at Max Six. What I've seen with business owners is it's hard to understand 
like what resources you need at what time, like especially when you're growing. So like when is an ideal time for a client? Like when are when would a business be ready for someone like you? Yeah, when I get asked that question, I, I typically I say it depends, but the reality is in most situations if the business has survived for about three years, then it's time to start to to engage somebody that does what I do for a living. Um, that first few years, it's really just about survival. I mean, we all know the statistics about success and failure in businesses and startups. And it, you got to get through that first three years to feel like, okay, now I'm on a good footing. There's revenue that's that's pretty understandable and predictable. But after that third year, then it's like, okay, how do we take this business to the next level? We're, we, we now need to start to put in, you know, the retirement plan, the employee benefits and all those sorts of things to kind of take it to the next level and then start to plan tax wise for me as the owner. It's uh, if I'm just looking at the world of just the investments part of it, of financially planning just i mean it seems like things are changing so quickly and 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 so dramatically at least in you talked about tesla i mean even even uh five years ago it would have been uh uh oh that's cool good for you uh hopefully that uh, that business doesn't go out of business or you know uh uh, and the stock price went through the roof or there i mean there's all kinds of examples new technology new things coming out has that changed? I mean, is it just constantly changing what you do? Or is it basically the same fundamentals? And there's just the pieces are changing uh, in the same board game? Yeah, fundamentally, it's it's typically the same. I mean, there are tax laws that change with each new administration. And so, you know, we have to pivot and do things just a little bit differently, or maybe we need to amend some estate planning documents or, you know, whatever the case may be. But you know, I tell my clients all the time, it, typically when you think of a financial advisor or a financial planner, you're thinking exactly like you just mentioned, you're thinking about the investments, right? And the investments are a part of it and they're an important part of it. But on the list of things that I do in, in importance for a business owner, investments are at the very bottom, the very bottom. The reality is there are plenty of people out there that can help you manage their investments. We do it. We do it very well, but it's the plan first that then says, okay, so now how should we invest those proceeds now that we have a plan in place and we know where we're going and what we need to accomplish? The investments are a vehicle to get us there. So what what are some of those other things? Is that is it more of the mitigating some of the risk type activities that you go through first before getting to the uh, opportunities for growth? Yeah, there's there's some of that. I mean, it's it's setting up your business and making sure, you know, did you choose the right entity type? You know, are, are you an LLC that, that files as an S, but should you actually be an S corp or should you be a C corp? Or, you know, there's there's entity types that that can make a difference in terms of the way that you're set up as you grow and what the eventual sale looks like. Um, there's estate planning for you personally, for your family that incorporates the business as the largest asset that eventually flows through to your estate. Have you set up proper documentation, legal agreements with the business partners that you have so that if something happens to one or both of you, or you know how many however many ever partners there are, um, so that if you know let's say for example, Kyle passes away tomorrow, heaven forbid, d- does your business partner realize that? If without proper planning that he or she is going to be in business with your wife, right? I mean, there, there's all these kinds of things that, that aren't being thought about and, and dealt with as far as the business owner is concerned. And so it is, it's that risk management piece. It's making sure that the legal side of things is set up appropriately. And okay, yes, this will change. It's a dynamic financial planning process, but I think I'm going to want to exit my business in 10 years or 12 years. What's the path? What are the steps that we have to do along the way to get us there? And then we implement that plan. So it always starts with the plan itself. And then, and then it's ongoing how we implement that plan. Sounds like business in general, how it should work, yep. right? That's, yep. I, think, I think business owners have their heads wrapped around that to a degree. 
I mean, that's that's part of it that we work with them on. Uh, with and Jen can speak to this, but our our leadership academy is: Are you taking the time to plan for not just putting out fires and reacting, but what you want to do to accomplish things to have a a reach of the purpose with your business? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely more out there. Uh, common speak that people have their heads wrapped around. I've got to do this with my business, or else. It's either going to go out of business or it just won't do what I want it to do. But when it comes to, I think you're right, the financial planning, it's something that, I don't know, I mean, it gets put on the back burner. I don't know if it's an education thing that people just don't know about it as much or or, or what, but yeah. Yeah, it, it does get put on the back burner quite a bit. Um, and part of that is, quite honestly, it's our industry. There are a lot of people who who are out there in my industry, you know, calling themselves financial planners, but they're really just investment advisors and they're not interested in working with business owners until six months before they sell the business because they want to invest the proceeds. And, and that's, you know, that's the unfortunate part of it is that we're, we're part of the problem. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be different and, and be a part of the solution. So that's a good point. Um, we've talked a lot about some of the distinctions, but like, what is the difference? Um, between the two, because I don't know that a lot of people really understand that. Uh, between financial planner and investment advisor, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So you can definitely be both, but unfortunately, and there there's actually parts of our industry that are trying to put in place certain titles that can be used only if you do certain things, but they're all used interchangeably right now. So financial planner, financial advisor, investment advisor, you know, all those, all those terms and titles are used interchangeably, but, you know, an investment advisor typically is, that's a part of what I do. So I am an investment advisor because there's, there's an actual license that goes along with that as an investment advisor representative. Um, and so that really just means you're providing advice on investments and nothing else. But when you're talking about financial planning, it's you're looking at the picture overall and you're taking into account the accounting side of things, the tax side, the legal aspects, you know, the investments themselves, but, but really doing from soup to nuts. Let's make sure that your plan is accomplished and an investment or the investment portfolio is just a part of that. How do you, do you have uh, certifications to create like, is part of what a part of what you bring, I imagine, Austin, is uh, years of doing this and just seeing what's worked, seeing what doesn't work, learning. Uh, uh, if I'm looking for a uh, financial planner, it's hard to get that uh, understanding of what someone's real experience is. Is there something I should be looking for that's uh, like? Hey, Austin has certain letters after his name or, or something or anything like that as well that sort of signals that you are somebody that could do a more comprehensive plan. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it's typically charm and good looks that get me hired, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, no, you're, you're absolutely right. There are, there are some educational programs. So uh, I have different designations. So first of all, I did go to business school. I have a master's degree in business administration uh, from BYU. But in addition to that, I've got a certified financial planner designation. um, So that the approved use of that is certified financial planner professional. Um, And then I also have a designation called chartered life underwriter, which really just means that um, I'm, I'm certified in more complicated design strategies using insurance products. Um, specifically life insurance, but it also covers long-term care, disability insurance, those sorts of things. Um, and then the last is is the most recent one that I just I just finished, and I'm waiting on a review of the plan that I had to submit um, for a business succession plan. But it's the it's certified business exit consultant. Very cool. Yeah. I was going to ask a question. So, do you help also with like transition from generation to generation and succession planning and and um, because I think a lot about um, so Max Six, like I was laughing when you said if Kyle's business partner of somebody having Kyle, Kyle's business partner would be in business with Kyle's wife, which is Kyle's father, and would be his daughter-in-law. So that even gets even good more luck, good luck to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your beautiful wife is not listening. That would be awesome. 
<laughs> Anyways, um, so do you guys, is that part of the plan as well as like succession? So if the business isn't going to be sold, but it's going to, there's a succession that needs to take place at some point, that's also what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I mean, with privately held businesses, that's pretty common that it just transitions to the next generation. But it's not as simple as one might think to where you just say, okay, you know, Kyle's dad, um, oh, I just drew, drew a blank on his name, Scott. Scott. Yeah. So Scott decides, okay, I'm finally ready to ride off into the sunset. Kyle, it's yours. Well, it's not that simple. I mean, it's got to be put together from, you know, either from a gifting standpoint or an acquisition. You know, Kyle takes on some debt, for example, to buy the business because Scott potentially, I don't know Scott's financial situation, but Scott potentially needs some liquidity himself so that he can walk away and be able to retire comfortably, right? It's all about financial independence. It's about working because you want to, not working because you need to, right? And so if Scott is not financially independent outside of Max 6, there's got to be some sort of an arrangement that's put in place so that Scott can retire and do the things that he wants to for the rest of his life. And so if it's not planned for appropriately, it could actually be uh, a problem for the business to where Max 6 still needs to continue to pay Scott so that Scott can do the things that he wants to. But guess what? They also now need to hire somebody to do what Scott did before. And so what does that do to the financials of the business? And so, you know, there are different strategies that can be employed where there's some leverage that's created for the business or, you know, some liquidity that's created inside of the business so that Scott has what he needs from a financial planning standpoint. There's something we talked about as a group in, in one of our Vistage meetings, I think, uh, maybe the last one, it came up about uh, succession planning and, and family transition in particular. And just the, the uh, statistics that are out there on that are frightening. <laughs> Uh, on success rates of the business or, or the business even uh, staying solvent over some period of time uh, in that transition. I mean, that's the, it fascinates me if I'm looking at it from a 10,000 foot level of what the dynamics are that are there. And it, it must just be, well, I don't know what it must be. I mean, you must see this from time to time come up that, uh, and like you said, if, if, uh, if we're if I'm essentially buying my dad out, at least he's set up in his own way separately from the business. But how do you deal with that? I mean, in how do you deal with that? Uh, statistically, it doesn't look good, but it happens all the time. And how do you set someone up for success like that? Uh, it yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. So I mean, unfortunately, Kyle, the statistics are not in your favor. But you're right. <laughs> But it can be mitigated if you take proper steps, right? So I, I'm not a business consultant, even though I went to business school and have an understanding of, of certain things that you should be doing in a privately held business as you get ready for that transition, which you and your dad are already doing, right? I mean, you're in there, you're running the business, you guys are interacting, and he's making sure that you're ready to take over when he rides off into the sunset. That's a big part. Um, but really where more complication comes from in family-owned businesses is the fact that there are siblings in the family who are not involved in the business and that still want to make sure that they're getting their piece of the pie, so to speak, when, when Scott passes away in this, in this scenario, right? And so how do, how do we equalize the estate, right? I mean, Kyle's helping run, run the business, but does that mean that Kyle should get all of dad's estate because all of it's tied up in max six right now? Probably not. So you got to, you got to plan for that because otherwise it's creating major family strife and no set of parents wants that to happen after they've passed away. And so, but they don't think through the proper planning to avoid that. We get the financial planner on the show and we still get back to, it's just people issues. <laughs> this is giving me yeah, so it, much anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's funny because, you know, we, one of the things that we send our business owner clients through is a survey called the Business Exit Readiness Index. And it's not all about financial. I mean, it does cover some financial aspects, but when we get to the end of that 
survey, it's letting us know and letting them know, are you financially and mentally ready to exit the business? And that's really where we have the issues is, you know, the family issues come into play sometimes too, but it's also the mental aspect of exiting a business. You've been an entrepreneur your whole life. You've built this from scratch and it's your baby. It's what you did all day, every day, probably 20 hours a day. And now all of a sudden you're going to step away. And there are all kinds of studies out there from PricewaterhouseCooper and others that say that most business owners about a year after they've sold their business profoundly regret having done so. And it's not because they don't have the financials to be comfortable for the rest of their life. It's that they weren't ready for the mental aspects. They stepped away, they traveled the world, they played a bunch of golf, they did you know whatever they thought they wanted to do for the first year or for the rest of their lives, but they did it for one year and now they regret having done it because all they want to do is go back to work. They want to feel useful again. They, you know, And so there, there truly is some aspect of the people side of the business and what we do where we're helping them to... to find other things to do with their time. What what else are you passionate about? Can you volunteer with certain groups? Can you help the underserved? Can you teach a business class to people who are wanting to do what you did? You know, there's a lot of things that you can do, but you do truly have to be mentally prepared to cross that threshold. It's something it's something I've been thinking a lot about. We talk a lot about purpose in business as Max 6 as uh Austin we knew each other in passing, at least through Conscious Capitalism, Arizona, prior to Vistage. And uh, this concept that a business has a higher purpose than just making money. And in doing so, and in following that purpose, will make way more money in the long term as well. It's so easy as a business owner, as a business leader, as somebody who just cares in the working world to get your identity wrapped into my purpose is this business purpose. And for uh, Max 6, that's building better communities where people and businesses thrive. But what's my individual purpose in life? And, and when is my time to put some thought into that so that if we, we do some planning on what happens if one of us gets hit by a bus, but if what if, uh, uh, in theory, the business got hit by a bus, where would that leave me as an individual in this world fulfilling on not just having fun and playing golf, like you said, but uh, really doing something in this world that's meaningful. And I think it's, all I've been doing is thinking about it. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's definitely worth spending some time on the more that I think about it. Not that it has to be completely separate from the business, but at least to just start, you know, thinking about it as a, as a business owner. Yeah, I, I think that it's, crucial that we that we do that and you know i i try to be as balanced as i can be with work life balance and you know we've talked about this in vistage a little bit we get pretty vulnerable and you know i i think that as business owners traditionally whether you're a male or female business owner traditionally we we do a poor job of maintaining balance in our lives and we get involved with either things we shouldn't be doing, you know, addiction wise, or we're just neglecting our families or the business takes priority over everything. And so our relationships suffer. Uh, And if we find something that we can be passionate about that specifically, if it involves our families, I think that that can, that can help us quite a bit. You know, luckily I've been an entrepreneur for 20 plus years and I've been married for uh, almost 23 years and there have been struggles, right? There have been years where it has not been good at all and you feel like you're on the verge of divorce, but it's something that I'm constantly trying to work on and failing at every day, but but continuing to work on regardless. Jen just reintroduced me to this concept of failing forward earlier this mm-hmm. week. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm internalizing this. You speak it out loud and it, it's, it shows up. That's uh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's such a good point for us and bringing it back on its balance in all areas of our life is important. But also I think, I think a lot about that in, in marriage is sometimes when it gets really hard, um, I've been married for eight years. I worry about this for my children that because they don't have the struggle and they don't have all this, what we're talking about earlier, but the second marriage gets hard or something, you know, it's just like, oh, well, I'm going to leave. And so I think, um, 
it'll be interesting to watch the next generation. I'm, I'm this is kind of a tangent. I'm not sure where I'm going with all of this, but it just made me think about your work ethic and your like commitments and also you're giving me a lot of hope. I was feeling a lot of anxiety a minute ago with all this talk about Scott passing away and something happening with Kyle. And now you're giving me hope with, you know, marriage can be hard. And especially if you're a business owner or, or um, an entrepreneur and you can work at it and it, and it can, uh, you can bring it back in alignment. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no, I, I tell you, I, there's, a lot of my life is about having uncomfortable conversations with business owners. But if you don't have the uncomfortable conversations, then things don't ever get dealt with, right? Whether it's the financial planning aspect or the personal side of, of your relationships, if, if you're not willing to have those uncomfortable conversations, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And, and you'll just be in the same position three years down the road as you are today. Jen, Jen did a uh, lunchtime presentation today and was talking about emotional health and, and what were we, t- uh, oh, we were talking about trauma work and, and saying, uh, well, I was saying <clears throat> you could essentially just sort of go through life and sit on the couch and be fine. But not only do you open yourself up for risks without thinking or planning for things, but you don't really give yourself the opportunity to fully experience the full realm of what's out there either. And so by putting in the time, having the uncomfortable conversations that nobody wants to have, it opens you up to be able to really experience a broader range of things, whether that's success in business or life, or uh, like we were talking about today, just experiencing connection to one another or emotional uh, well-being. I mean, it's, uh, it, it sucks going through it, but you know, on the other side of it, at some point, it's like, Oh, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. So our show is called the future of work. Um, and I think, I mean, you deal in a lot of ways with the future, right? Planning. And, um, do you see something on the horizon, um, in the next couple of years, um, that will change the landscape of, um, planning for business owners? Like, what do you see in the next five years? Get a crystal ball. Yeah, I think honestly, uh, what the pandemic has taught us is that providing financial advice does not have to be in person, uh, sitting across from each other and on this, you know, at the same conference table. You know, I've been doing this for a little over 20 years, and I've always felt like you needed to be in person, belly to belly dealing with really important issues. Um, but I've, I've onboarded some new clients over the past year that I've still never met in person due to the pandemic. And so I think what you're going to see is that there will be a, a greater adoption of online tools to receive financial advice, right? There are lots of tools out there where you can do certain things on your own and you can find about everything that you're looking for online but there will still be a personal aspect to financial planning, right? Just because you can read about how to set up an estate plan correctly doesn't mean that you should do it on your own, right? <laughs> and so um, having that, that ability to connect with somebody via Zoom, I mean, I've, I've got a client who, who actually lives very close to me in the same neighborhood and we meet via Zoom because it's more efficient for both of us even though it's close, but having to get in the car and having to, you know, put everything into your briefcase and then pull everything out and then try to look at a screen together when we can just sit on a Zoom meeting and share screens and see the things together, you know, the technology actually makes us more efficient. And I've got clients in, I think it's 15 states at this point. Um, Most of them are concentrated in three or four kind of California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah uh, area. But I've got some outliers, and I believe that I'll be able to actually expand beyond the 15 states that I serve today and really take an approach and say, gosh, you know what? If you own a privately held business and your revenues are somewhere between five and 50 million, you've got some things that you need to deal with. And gosh darn it, I'm the best guy to help you with that. And it doesn't matter that you live in West Virginia and I live in, in Arizona. I'm the guy. 
let's let's get together online and we'll we'll talk through some of the issues that you're dealing with and and we'll put you on the right track. So I think that's really one of the biggest things that we're going to see going forward is that there's so much technology out there that helps making the planning process easier and it doesn't have to be in person. It's awesome to see some of this technology has been around for a, a while and it's been quickly changing because of the pandemic, but how quickly we were able to adapt as people, as human race, as uh, to through technology at a quicker pace, be able to establish trust with each other. You've, yeah. I've never met this person. I've never pressed the flesh, you know, whatever. I've never looked into their eyes, looking at a screen, but uh, we are in adaptable creatures. We find a way and it's, it's just been fascinating to watch as, uh, you know, if you had said 10 years ago, you go into business with someone and they live on the other side of the world and you'll never meet them. It would have sounded absolutely crazy. Just totally yeah. insane. The risk on that is through the roof. And here we are. That's yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the Zoom, you know, Zoom meeting technology, I mean, you're, you've got a camera that's a little bit further away than, than Jen and I do, but you know, you can you can read social cues. You can see what's going on with somebody's face. You can see if they're if they're you know folding their arms or if they're leaning forward, listening to what you're having to say. And so, you know, some of the same social cues that I would pick up from clients in the past in person, I can pick up just as well via Zoom. And the efficiency with the technology via Zoom is so much greater than in person. And we get through the process quicker, and the clients appreciate the you know, the technology and they're seeing things on the screen and we're making changes on the fly and saying, you know, whatever, let's say that you sold in 10 years instead of eight years, or let's say that you, you know, you saved an additional $2,000 a month compared to what you're saving. And you're changing that on the screen and they're seeing that in real time. That's a benefit compared to the way that I did things a year ago. And I've adopted technology pretty well comparatively. I've, I've always been active on LinkedIn and other social media channels. And I've generated business that way, which was already a little bit ahead of most financial planners in my industry. But this kind of even forced me to take another step forward and say, how, how can I adopt technology even more to be more efficient for me and for my clients? One day, this technology will let us know if this... Uh... This guy with the valuable spreadsheets on the other end of the screen is wearing pants. But for now, yeah, I'll just right. trust the base I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just take the mystery out of it for you. I do have pants on, but they are sweatpants. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Me too. I have, I have pants on. Just wondering. <laughs> well, now that we've answered that question, uh, mm -hmm. we have a little bit of time left and we like to, uh, Jen and I each have a question that we ask each of our guests, which has nothing to do with anything we've been talking about or anything at all. It's because we're curious and we are collecting answers and we will do something one day with those answers. But for now, it's because I'm interested in the answer. So now, now I'm a little nervous. Yeah, you, sh yeah, you don't have to be too nervous. <laughs> It's but but before we go through that, actually, if you if you don't mind, I'll just um, one of the things that we were going to talk about was kind of the future for Backbone Financial. So I co-host a podcast, as you guys know, Tycoons of Small Biz. You guys are actually going to be guests on my podcast next week, so we're going to flip the script a little bit. But uh, my co-host on that podcast, he and I are formally merging our practices together, and we will be called Backbone Planning Partners going forward. And we have a new logo that's coming out and the website that will go live. And so we're excited about what that means. And we're bringing another advisor on board with us out of Colorado. And so we're, we're growing and, uh, and taking that leap forward. It's exciting. Yeah. That is really cool. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So Austin, what is your favorite book of all time? Oh, my favorite book of all time. Oh, probably this is going to tell you how much I care about business and, and where I spend my time and efforts, but probably either good to great or who moved my cheese. Two great books. Definitely. It, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I am, would like to know 
given the year or the last however many months we are now, 15 months um, that we've all experienced, what's one lesson outside of business that you've learned that you want to carry forward? Lesson that I've learned outside of business. I think that uh, we have and can find ways to spend more time with our families in a way that's beneficial to each member of that family. So for example, we purchased an RV pretty early on when this pandemic hit um, and realized, you know what, we we're self-contained in the RV. We can still go and do some things. We can go places that are safe. We can spend time together as a family. Uh, I can put a green screen in that RV and nobody has any idea that I'm hosting my podcast or a client meeting from an RV when they think that I'm in my office in Scottsdale. Right. And so, um, it's just being, being creative and understanding the importance of, of spending time together. Um, the other thing that I've, that I've learned, I would say is that mental health is a real issue in our in our country and it needs to be front and center, right? I mean, we talk about lives that were lost in this pandemic, which is devastating, but there are way more people who are going to be affected by this mentally for a much longer period of time than the lives that we lost from the pandemic. Are you in your RV right now? (laughs) No, I am not. (laughs) Okay. That, but I can't promise you that next week I won't be. <laughs> there we go. I love it. I, I love um, that collectively we've all kind of reimagined work. And I think you bring up such a great point about the importance of family. And um, that also is a lesson that I learned for myself is really when everything stopped and you didn't have an option, it was really easy to see what was most important um, and spending that time. So I love that you found a creative way to do that and still do all the things that you love. And I also love that you bought an RV as like, which is in the toy category and you're a financial planner. So that gives us all hope that we can have fun in our lives. Yeah. It's not about saving every penny and eating ramen your whole life to be financially independent later in life. Yeah. Awesome. Can you please tell anyone listening how we could find you online or learn more about you or your business? Yeah, so I'm very active on LinkedIn. You can find me just by searching Austin Peterson CFP uh, on LinkedIn. My website is currently backbonefinancial.com, but in the next probably week, it's going to transition to backboneplanning.com. And um, we're, you know, we're very active on there and we'll be revamping that website a little bit. But Landon Mance and I would, would love to hear from any business owner that are, that are in need of financial planning services. Thank you, Austin Peterson, founder of Backbone Financial and Financial Planner. Until next time, we are off to continue building better communities where people and businesses thrive. Thank you for listening to the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations with your hosts, Jen Burrell and Kyle McIntosh. Each episode shines the spotlight on business leaders who are defining what a healthy and productive workplace looks like in Arizona and beyond. To be part of the conversation, schedule a visit of the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center in Tempe, Arizona, and connect with us at max6.com. Remember to like and subscribe to the Future of Work Water Cooler Conversations on Apple Podcasts.